Hey y'all, today we're going to be talking about something called function notation. And uh, we really want to be able to answer the question at the end of this, why do we even use function notation? And we'll go through what it is, um, and then we'll talk about like why, why you would even want to use it. So why is function notation used? So what we really want to do is be able to use and interpret and imply, uh, apply function notation. So in order to do that, we need to be able to define the components of function notation. We need to be able to write functions to model real world scenarios. And we want to be able to analyze real world functions. In other words, we want to be able to describe what's happening uh, uh, with, uh, with equations. So a few different vocabulary terms that we're going to be using as we go through this. One is what a function is, and we've defined that before. Um, so I'm not really going to spend too much time talking about that. Uh, it's just when you have a relationship where each input is paired with exactly one output. Um, so the input is what, you're, what we're going to call the independent variable. So that's actually down here. Independent variable being usually your x. Okay, it's the function. It's the variable in the function that uh, represents the input values, and the variable that represents your output values we call the dependent variable. Okay. Uh, now, last time we talked about uh, two different types of graphs: uh, continuous graphs and discrete graphs. Um, so just as a little, little reminder, a continuous graph is one in which all the points are connected. So it doesn't look like a scatter plot or anything. It could be a line, a curve, or something like that. But basically, it's something that you could draw without picking up your pencil. A discrete graph is one in which you have these individual points and they're not connected. Uh, there's a finite number of data points there. So you might see it like a scatter plot. There may or may not be a pattern, um, but, uh, but what the important part is that it's actually just individual points instead of being connected. And finally, what the main focus of today is going to be is function notation. And this is just going to be another way of writing an equation that is a function. So there's some equations that are functions and some that aren't. Uh, and so when, when you do have a f an equation that is a function, there's a special way that we're going to write it, and that is called function notation. So just to kind of review what a function is, recall that a function is any relationship where you have exactly one output for every input. So each value for the independent variable is going to correspond to one uh, value that is uh, one of the dependent values. So let's see, in a function, each value for the independent, I'm going to spell this right, dependent variable, uh, we're talking about the input values here, maps to exactly uh, one value uh, for the dependent variables. So uh, if you have like a mapping diagram, something like this, each input can only go to one output. It's not going to go to two, two different ones. Uh, so to make a mapping diagram, um, this is where you're just uh, showing what the inputs and outputs are. Like for instance, if you have a function that's made up of these four points, um, now just as a little sidebar, since there's four points, they're countable, we say that this is going to be a discrete situation, not a continuous one. A um, little sidebar there. But, uh, but the way you show a mapping diagram is you basically just draw arrows from the domain to the range. Uh, so like 1 comma 7, negative 2 comma 0, 3 comma negative 3, and four comma seven. So we don't need to write seven again here. We can just have an arrow going like this. Um, so this would be a function because each input only has one output. Uh, it's okay if you have two different inputs that have the same output, like we see that here, one and four, both output a seven. Um, but if you have like one going to seven and one going to zero, that's gonna prevent it from, uh, from being a function. And we'll see an example like that over here. So here, uh, 3 is going to go to 9, 4 is going to go to negative 1, and I'm getting these just from these coordinates here. 3 is also going to 2, so I'm not going to rewrite 3 here. When you create a mapping diagram like this, you don't uh, write any numbers that 
uh, occur more than once twice. You just leave it as once and you can draw two arrows. So three also goes to two. And you see right away that's what's gonna break th this relationship. Um, and when I say break, I mean it's not gonna be a function. And finally zero goes to negative five. So notice that we have this value three, which has two different outputs. And so that's what makes this not a function. So if we were able to write an equation to represent these two situations, uh, we could use function notation for this one. We would not be able to use function notation for this one because it's not a function. So in order to use function notation, it's gotta be a function is, is basically the bottom line here. So we've seen a bunch of equations, um, particularly written in like y equals mx plus b format. Um, this, any equation, any linear equation written like this, where m and b are, are constants, so you have like numbers there instead of variables, um, is gonna be a function. And so basically the way function notation works is your dependent variable, like y here, we're gonna rewrite as f of x. So these two things basically mean the same thing. It's just that we don't really need a separate variable here uh, declared. We can just uh, uh, name those outputs as a function of x. So I know this can be a little confusing. Um, in the past, you probably have seen something like this. And the way, the correct way to interpret that is 3 times 2. But when you see f of x, there's a little bit of context there that you just need to know that this does not mean f times x, okay? f is, is, is the name of the function. Um, so th this is not the same thing. And what this is basically saying is that whatever's in the parentheses here is, um, is gonna be what your input is. So if you see a number here, that's what you're gonna be plugging into x. So just wanna be clear that when I write f parentheses x, uh, that's not f times x, even though like if you see three times two written like this, like this is three times two, I know it looks exactly the same. Um, that's, uh, I guess, uh, kind of unfortunate, but um, the reality is that you just have to know that when you see a function written like this, that this is not uh, indicating multiplication at all. It's indicating a function. So if you have y equals three x minus four, you could write that as f of x, looks like this printer didn't come out very good, equals 3x minus 4. So the, the actual expression looks exactly the same. This is going to be how you compute your output. This x is your input. So another way to think about, like, after, uh, you know, after you evaluate this, like, let's say we wanted to find um, f of 2. Okay, so basically we want to know what's the value of the function when x is 2. So the number inside that parenthesis is 2. Uh, that's x. The way you would say that is like, okay, well, three times x, and since x is two, we say three times two minus four. So that'd be six minus four is two. So f of two is two. And what this is basically showing is, like right here, this is just another way of saying that two comma two is a coordinate on, on, the, on the line, on the graph. Uh, so you might see this written either way, but these two statements essentially mean the same thing. This is just writing it as a coordinate, and this is writing that coordinate as uh, using function notation. So let's look at another example. We've got 2r equals s plus 1, where s is the independent variable. So since um, r, the, the, the implication here is that r is the dependent variable, so what we need to do is solve for r here. So if I have 2r equals s plus 1, uh, what I need to do, and that's kind of what this is trying to show, is I need to divide everything by 2. Um, and that, that's each individual term here. So f of, so when I do that, what I get is r equals 1 half s plus 1 half. So in order to use function notation, you have to make sure that your dependent variable is isolated. So it says s is the independent variable. That's kind of like your x. You know, it's playing the role of x. r is playing the role of y here. We're not going to call it x and y because that's not what it's called here, but uh, conventionally you would see x and y. Uh, but once you get that dependent variable isolated, then we can rewrite it as a function. So we can say, instead of using r here, we'll say f of s. And that's the way you read this, f of s. 
And what, what this is saying is that there is a function um, with s as your input, and this is how you find your outputs. So basically a function is just like a rule. It's just saying whatever you input into this function machine, it's going to output something specific. Um, and so you can evaluate this. Like for instance, uh, if I say what's f of 10 here? Okay, the way to find f of 10. In other words, uh, a similar question might be what is the value of r when s is 10? All right, this is basically indicating that s is 10 here. Well, we use the function rule to find what that output would be. 1 half times 10 plus 1 half would be 5 plus a half. Um, we'll just go ahead and convert over to decimal real quick, but it'd be 5.5. So f of 10 is 5.5, and what that means is that you've got a coordinate 10 comma 5.5 on the graph. Basically, when you see this function notation written like this, it's saying that f of x equals y, where this is the x coordinate, that's the y coordinate. Or it doesn't have to be x and y, like here we've got r and s, so like this would be like f of s equals r. Uh, it just kind of depends on whatever variables are being used uh, in this context. So um, just to kind of clarify what I'm saying here, the meaning of f of x is the output value of f, so f is the, the function, when the input is x. So I already kind of said this, uh, but basically this does not mean f times x, and this didn't print out very good, but really this says, let me kind of write this so you can see it a little better. Like if, it, if the question is what does f of 1 equals 7 mean? then the 1 uh, is your input and the 7 is your output. So you could say the output of f is 7 when the input is 1. So if you were to like try to graph this on a, on a coordinate plane, you would graph the point 1 comma 7. That's your x and your y, your input and your output. So it's not really that much different than one you've already done as far as like graphing equations. It's just a different kind of notation. It's just called function notation. But this function notation is very common. And as you move forward in your math career, you're going to be using function notation more so than not. Um, so this is just more, uh, more using function notation here. Uh, so we've done this before. Um, it says, how can the ordered pair be written using function notation? And I've kind of hinted at this as we've gone along, but now let's kind of solidify it. So your input is always your first value, okay? I already got an arrow there. Uh, so your input is the first value. The output is your second value. Usually we say it's x and y, but it, you might be using different variables. Uh, and so if we want to write it using function notation, we say f of 1 is t negative 2. All right, this is kind of, let me go ahead and just write it out to the side. f of 1 equals negative 2. This is how it's going to look. So this is just the function notation way of writing this coordinate. So let's say we, we're given a function that just consists of a bunch of points. It says, what is f of 0? Um, so once you understand what this notation means, this is a very simple question. It's just asking, what's the value of the function when x is 0? And so all you have to do is find where x is 0. So that's going to be here. And, it, and you want to find the output. So the output's going to be 3. So if the input is 0, then the output is 3. So f of 0 equals 3. You could also say that f of 1 equals negative 2. You could also say f of 5 equals 0, f of 3 equals 5, and I'm getting those just from basically just copying these coordinates down. Here's another example. We've got uh, you know, 1 comma negative 2, 5 comma 0. Actually, are those the same points? I think those might have been. Yeah, it's the same exact point. So this is kind of a, the flipped version of that question where before I was saying, like, what's f of, like, like what's f of 1, right? Like, let's go ahead and write, let, let's start by just writing all of these out in function notation. f of 1 is negative 2, f of 5 is 0, f of 0 is 3, and f of 3 is 5. So, I mean, one, if you write all those out real quick, this question can be real easy, but basically you're saying what input does f of x equal 5? So another way to interpret this is what x value 
corresponds to y equals 5. Okay, in other words, if the output is 5, what's the input? So once you understand what that's asking, it's real easy, right? Well, if the output is 5, then the, out, the input's got to be 3, right? So the output is 5, the input is 3, and so you would say like f of 3 is 5, which is what we wrote here, uh, although it looks like <laughs> my handwriting's pretty terrible there. That's supposed to be a 3. Um, you can play with this function notation not just if you're given a list of points, but an equation, a table, a mapping diagram, all those things will work out. Um, so let's say here's my domain and range. Um, specifically, if we're looking at like negative 3, 0, you know, this, so there, basically you can list these as coordinates, negative 3, 0, 2, 3, 7, negative 4, 0, 2, and 3, 2, or you could write those same relationships using function notation like f of negative 3 equals 0, f of 2 equals 3, f of, what was that, negative 7 equals negative 4, and so on. f of 0, we might as well just finish it out since there's not that many va uh, variables here, let's see, or uh, values rather, f of 3 equals 2. Um, so anyway, that, so you could write it either way. So this is like three different ways of showing the same function just in a different a representation. Um, so let, let's actually look at the question here. How can a domain value of negative 3 and corresponding radian values of 0 be written using function notation? Well, this is how you do it right there. Okay, so in, first you identify the input and output. So the elements in the domain consist of your inputs. So the input in this case is negative 3 and the output is 0. So the way you would write it is like this. Um, this is just kind of going through that a little bit more. F of the input, okay, uh, in this case would be, what was it again? Uh, negative 3 is 0. So that's just kind of going back to that last. Oh, it's got it down here. So uh, very good. What is F of negative 7? Well, that means the input is negative 7. And so F of negative 7 is negative 4. Same thing here. For what input value does f of x equal 3? Be careful. It's asking for which input outputs a 3. So the output is 3 here, and then it's asking for the input, which would be 2. So the input's 2, so the way you'd write that is f of 2 equals 3. Oh, my, my, that head is blocking the way. All right, there you go. Um, yeah, okay. So, so basically we're just writing all these coordinates, all these relationships using this function notation. Um, all right, so let's, let's look at some real world problem stuff here. So some word problems, if you will. A tablet has 32 gigabytes of storage available. Uh, pff, that's nothing, jeez, you need to, you know, this tablet needs to up its game here, okay. Anyway, and each video requires two gigabytes. Um, either a short video or, yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty reasonable depending on what the video is. The amount of storage left in gigabytes represents the variable s, and the number of videos downloaded represents, is represented by the variable v. So uh, the question here is to, well, I don't know why it's asking. It's right here. I'm not going to re rewrite all that, that whole st statement, but here's the question. Okay, We want to write a function that models the relationship. In other words, let's write an equation but use function notation. So the clues here, let's kind of break this down, is that first of all, it starts out with 32 gigabytes of storage. Okay, so the tablet itself has 32 gigabytes of storage. And each video, when you download it, is going to eat up two of those gigabytes. So if you, like for instance, if you uh, downloaded one video, you would only have 30 gigabytes left. If you downloaded two videos, you would have 28 gigabytes left, and so on. So we're, we're starting to understand here what the relationship is between the variables. Um, and just to reiter uh, reiterate here, the input variable is V, or the number of videos. And the output vi variable, what did they say it was? Uh, S. And that represents the amount 
of storage storage available. Okay, so our equation is going to be, well, the amount of storage, you're going to start with 32 gigabytes, and then for each video, you're going to take away 2 gigabytes, so minus 2 gigabytes per video. That's the equation. If we write it using function notation, we would say that f of v equals 32 minus 2v. So let's check. Let's see if this actually works out. It says that, hey, five, if I, you download five videos, you should be left with 22 gigabytes. So let's test that out. F of five, and we want to know, is that actually 22 here? 32 minus two times five. So two times five is 10. 32 minus 10 would be Yep, it is in fact 22. So f of 5 is 22. And what that means is if you download five videos, you're going to have 22 gigabytes left uh, in storage. Here's another one. An 8 inch candle burns at a rate of 5 inches every hour. Write a function that models the relationship between the height of the candle and the inches. So with all of these linear relationships uh, or these linear functions, um, there's basically two numbers you got to look at, and that's whatever the start value is, in this case 8, and then whatever the rate of change is, in this case 0.5 per hour. Uh, and then you also need to think about, like, well, do you want to add that rate of change or do you subtract it? And here, if we're talking about a candle burning and our dependent variable is the height, we would expect that the height would decrease, right? It would go down. So when we write the equation, we're going to write something like minus 0.5x or t or whatever the variable is. But let's uh, read a little closer and, and, and define all these things. So our input is the time uh, in hours, and it asks that we use uh, the variable t here. And then finally, the output is the height of the candle in inches. And then we're not even going to, we don't need to write a separate variable for that. We can just write it, since we're going to write it in function notation. Now this is saying h of t. That's fine. It doesn't have to be F. F is just the most common one. Um, but if you do want to like give it a name that's relevant to the context, you can call it H for height, no problem. Okay, so, so this is still using function notation here. This is not say H times T. This is function notation here. And you just gotta, you just have to know to look out for that. So the function h of t equals 8 minus 0.5t, that's kind of what we're talking about. We've got the start value, and then we're subtracting uh, 0.5 inches for each hour. And it models the height of the candle over time. Okay, now there are, you know, anytime you have these uh, real world problems, there's going to be some realistic uh, con uh, constraints on the variables. What I mean by that is like for instance the height can't be negative, right? Like, and, uh, 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 and, and neither can the time. I mean even if you were to sort of take this pattern backwards, the candle can't be taller than it was originally. Um, so let's see, are there any constraints on this graph of the function? Well first of all the time and, and height cannot be negative. Those values don't really make sense in this context. And values can only be in the first quadrant because basically what's going to happen here is you're going to start at 8 and then decrease until you get to 0, right? Because you can't be negative here. So I haven't even labeled any numbers here, but this is going to be sort of the general look of the graph. So when you think about like domain and range here, the domain goes from here to here. Uh, that's our, we call it T. So we'd say, this is just, it doesn't really ask this, but couldn't hurt to revisit it. The domain here, the time, would go from zero to however long it takes to, to completely burn down. These numbers are pretty easy to work with. If you're burning down in you know, a half inch every hour, that's gonna take 16 hours to totally burn down. So this would be like 16. And then finally, the range, which is gonna be like your, your dependent values, is gonna be from 0 to 8. Okay, so the, the h values, h is a function of time, are going to go from 0 to 8 because 8 is what it started at and it'll burn all the way down to the ground. 
will the graph of the function be a continuous or discrete graph? Okay, well we already sort of sketched it out, and this one would have to be continuous because you can have fractional values here. You cannot get from set eight inches to seven inches without hitting everything in between. It's just impossible. Like the, the candle's not gonna suddenly, you know, be here and then like instantly be down here. No, it's gotta go like, at a, it's gotta go smoothly. It's gotta hit every single height in between. So that's where we have a continuous uh, situation. So the graph is continuous here. Uh, we do want to connect the dots. So just to analyze that further, oh look, they're asking about domain and range. Uh, so we're a little ahead of the game here. So at zero hours, the height is eight inches, and we already we already talked about this. At sixteen hours, the height is zero inches. Um, so the domain here, uh, we already said this, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. it. Goes from zero to eight, and then the range would be from zero to sixteen, just like we wrote on the other page. Um, and so here's the graph. We already sketched that out, so not much more to say about that. Okay, so you know the original question here is like, why would you even want to use function notation? Like, what's wrong with just writing y equals three x plus two instead of f of x equals three x plus two? Okay, and really the 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 main advantage to using function notation. I'm going to write this out. Okay. So the use of function notation makes it clear which variable is independent and which is dependent. Dependent. So like this one, like you could solve this for x, and and you could technically write a function of x in terms of y, but um, it will when you're when you're defining your functions, it's just a lot easier to see what the input is supposed to be when you write it like this. The input's always going to be what's in parentheses here, so it just really shows off the relationship between the function rule and its inputs. So that's it for today. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, I'll be happy to go over any of that with you. I know this unit has been pretty heavy on uh, conceptual understanding of what a function is. Um, so if you, if you have any questions about what any of these terms mean, um, please let me know. Um, and uh, this is the last, uh, uh, the last lesson before our first test for this nine weeks. Um, which means that like next time we'll review and then the next time we'll test. So make sure that you, you can get yourself totally caught up with those Edgenuity quizzes uh, before, before then because you want to make sure that you're totally ready for the test uh, when, when we get there. So have a great day. I'll talk to you later.